All I can say is thank you. As you're walking in, I just thought it'd be better for us to get into this because there's not going to be enough time anyway. Uh, as you're walking in, just uh, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> and as for the, those of you that have been waiting, thank you. Thank you very much for this respect. And uh, the fan base here has been overwhelming. For all of you that are sitting here and walking in, I have to tell you, this is my first uh, convention. And you know what? I was going to sit down, but I will lose too much eye contact with people and they'll have to go crazy because I'm too low. So I'm going to stand up and do this so I can see all of you. I, I enjoy seeing you as much as you enjoy seeing me. And I've enjoyed just meeting people talking with you uh, and through this has been an extraordinary experience and I can't believe how many of you are here right now doing this. Uh, it's, uh, I think we uh, filled the room. So it's been really, really something special. Can I have uh, this microphone turned on so I can talk from here? I didn't think, I thought I could sit and discuss this, but as soon as I sit down, I lose a lot of, everybody starts to lose it, so I better stand up. Let me just get started. Me and podiums don't get along too well. I <laughs> just become like standing up without this podium and without the table. <laughs> just, you know, I, I'm not kidding you. It's, it's very, I feel so self conscious. <laughs> I'm not Obama. I'm Obama. <laughs> Adama for president. Adama for president. I think you guys know that. I mean, I think uh, you guys, <laughs> there's some of you that I think did it. Uh, I don't know who did it, but somebody decided to um, make this a situation that I would, you know, Adama for president. And, and I, it was really funny. I mean, basically, I was really stunned by that. So all I can say is that this is your time. It's not mine. I'm here to just get to know you and to say thank you to you publicly. That's why I did this, and I'm very grateful that I did it. And uh, as you know, that uh, I do do speaking. <laughs> but the kind of speaking that I do is a little different than this kind. I usually go into situations and they, I deal with, has anyone ever heard me speak in, good, there has been a few people. I do, uh, I work in cultural relationship, really, in the United States of America, which is really needed. Okay, it's really, there's too many people that look like me, either there or coming there, and they weren't quite ready for that kind of, a, of an influx of people of color in the United States of America. So. Anyway, it's changing quickly, as is Canada, very much so. And uh, I'm grateful for it because it's more perspective of what we are in the, in the planet as a whole. So I do a lot of speaking, but I do it on a different level. This is the first time I've ever done this, so I'm going to open it up for you guys. It's going to get pretty crazy, I'm sure. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll give you a number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we'll take the first ten. Okay, here we go. One, go. Question. Go ahead. You've done some really great directing, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and what you enjoy doing most. And she asks, I've done some really interesting directing, or, you know, which. Great directing. Great directing. <laughs> I didn't want to use that word. Um, and and do I, which do I like the most, you know, working in front of the camera or directing it? And I gotta tell you, I've never done any directing that I didn't work as an actor in. So I have got to tell you, it's been an extraordinary experience. It started off with a film called, actually it started off with Miami Vice. I did one episode. And uh, I started directing then. And I started, and I, I was the person in the show. I ended up becoming, uh, it was Bushido. It was the only single episode I ever directed and I ever wanted to direct. 
I helped write the piece, and then I ended up uh, directing, and I was very grateful for that. Um, then I did American Me, which yes. is a very, very difficult film. For those of you that have never seen that film, don't see it. <laughs> it wasn't made for you. And then I went on to do, now I've done, I think, six Battle Stars. And uh, I'm doing the major motion picture for Battle Star. Definitely going to be a mind-blowing experience where they have taken us. I got to tell you, I've never done, I've never done any kind of work that's even gotten close to what Ron Moore has done with this storytelling. This is the most, the most extensive story I've ever been a part of, and I mean, you couldn't do it any other way than 80 hours to tell the story, and it's been extraordinary. The ending is. Oh. <laughs> Emotionally, heartbreaking. Aww. I'm telling you for a reason because I don't want you guys to, you know, think that you're going to go through this without getting yourself really twisted. <laughs> Ron has no mercy. And it's been very true. He's been very true to it. It's very dark and it gets darker. Last, uh, the, you know, the end of the third season was just brutal. It was simply brutal. It, it, it devastated us when we were doing it, when we realized what he had done. You know, he had nuked the earth. There was nothing left. And we couldn't even stay there. And so it's brutal what happens to us. Not many of us make it. <laughs> I will tell you that. <laughs> Which is really the truth. It is the truth of what actually if you take a look, you know, Blade Runner did a wonderful job of creating a great art. And when we started to do this uh, work on, on this program, that was the, the, the door we walked into. We were not going to do anything less than what really Blade Runner had created as far as reality. And it paid off. I mean, that was a door that nobody had walked through as far as you know, science fiction was concerned. They had left that room completely alone. The door was open, the world had been explored, and there we were, bam, without uh, anyone else walking in. So when I talked to Ron and David Icke at the very beginning and they gave me the script, um, I said, uh, hey, hey, hey. He's here, he's here to answer any questions also. But uh, basically he's here just to, to say thank you to all of us. All of us here. And he's fantastic. Today, yesterday was his birthday, so wish him a happy birthday. You all know it's been uh, recorded very well. I told uh, Ron and David at the very beginning that if there were any creatures of the Black Lagoon that came out after me, I was going to faint, and, and then I was off the show. <laughs> and I was part of the contract. So he could not, uh, even the hybrid, they were afraid to talk to me about it. <laughs> so they are like, oh, jeez. But then I had no scenes with the hybrid, so I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, that was it. But as far as directing went, it's been an extraordinary experience. And working with the caliber of, you know, these guys, it's been... <laughs> By the way, he has his own television show now. Yeah. So he's here. He's here representing himself as the lead of his own show. And uh, it seems like everyone got their own show off of this one, except for me. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay because I can still direct. He, he wants me to come and direct him in his show, so yeah. I always have a job. <laughs> but directing to me has been uh, a blessing. Uh, it's been a great means of expression, and it's been something that I've really enjoyed doing, and now I get to do it for the film. So we work again. He's starring in the movie. So it's going to be an honor and privilege to direct them again. Question number two, where are you? 
two, go. Oh, oh. Um, go ahead. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could kind of uh, talk about uh, the end of Maelstrom and uh, what happened with the boat. <laughs> All I can tell you is I got another one here that I didn't bring with me. It's on my desk, and somebody brought over a little boat. What happened to the end of it? You saw it. Didn't you see it? Didn't you see what happened to the boat? <laughs> Anybody here doesn't know about the boat? Okay, one person. <laughs> there was this incredibly expensive boat. <laughs> Beautiful boat. It was handmade. It was very old. It was very, very expensive, and I had no idea. <laughs> that it was very old and it was very expensive, so... Ah. <laughs> so they decided to put it in front of me <laughs> in the middle of a big dramatic moment in the history of Madonna and it was all over about the crying. I mean, by the time I finished the scene, everybody's mouth was on the ground. Everybody's going to... And then, you know, the props department came in and said, it's the only one of its kind. <laughs> like, what? So needless to say, that was it. That was the story. I bashed it to hell. <laughs> and then they re, they, our, our team re, reconstituted it. They, they did. And then... <laughs> Ty! <laughs> he lands on it in one of the fights. He goes, <laughs> that was it. They, can't, they couldn't rebuild it anymore. So, <laughs> Question number three. Go ahead. Surprising aspect of uh, Adama's character development over the course of the series. I think the whole thing. I think that everybody's development was insane. You got to remember. I mean, we had no idea where the journey was going. He had. He was so pissed. <laughs> he was so angry. Him and, and and Michael Hogan almost. I mean, literally flipped. They were so angry that they were, you know, Cylons. They couldn't, and they wouldn't. I, you didn't ever accept it. Did you accept it? Yeah, I guess you did. And so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm fine does. with it. I'm fine with it. Thank you. Fine. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> if you ever hear Hogan, Hogan, uh, to this day, you know, Colonel Ty will n it refuses to accept the fact. So, won't even play it. Doesn't, you know, just constantly angry at people when he's in that character mode and has to say something about the fact that he is one. And he never had, he only told me once. He only confesses it up, confesses it up once. And we talk about it and I, oh, I get so angry. I was so hurt by this guy. And of course, you guys saw, see it are going to see what happens. It's, well, you saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it was terrible. And, um, but anyway, needless to say, that's, that's, that whole situation is crazy. And, and so Adama, I mean, I'm an alcoholic now. <laughs> Full blown. I, mean, I smoke grastic pills. <laughs> I'm a whimpering idiot. I end up... I mean, he would set. <laughs> Under the influence of my character, I am true method. <laughs> right? So needless to say, I mean, it, it's been a, no one could have even begun to, can you imagine? I mean, here you have the, the what you call the stable force of the show in respects of the root. He's the father figure. He's, you know, the, this, this commanding admiral, you know, the, the whole the, the future of the human race is on his shoulders, and he, <laughs> he's on the ground rolling around. It's really, really, really. I mean, so I loved it. <laughs> Captain Kirk never went to that show. <laughs> you talk about a real situation. That that's why the military, I mean, colonels watch this program. Every, the military loves this program. In Iraq, man, they love this program. And they, they cherish it because of that reality, because of the fact that their commanding people, when you get in the inside, are just as fragile as everybody else. And you cannot do this and expect, you know, you're, 
to hold up this masquerade of, yeah, I'm the commanding officer, I'm the chief, and I'm never going to break down. I mean, can you imagine Clint Eastwood doing this? I mean, he never would break down. Nobody would break down. They, that isn't who they are, you know. Don Johnson breaking down. You know? <laughs> they don't do that. And so when they gave me the opportunity, I said, man, you guys really want me to do this? Yeah, I love you guys. <laughs> and that's where we went. And that's what, I think that's what Chief did, and that's what uh, all of us ended up doing. We became very grateful that we were a part of this show because of the fact that the character bases were like this. I mean, they really went through the drama of it. And the trauma. And, uh, and that's what I liked the most. So, yeah, Adama was uh, unpredictable. And still is, and uh, hello. <laughs> You'll call him back. <laughs> Question, go ahead. Uh, one of my favorite themes in Battlestar Galactica is the father son relationship and how it plays out. So uh, I like it best because it's mirroring my life too. I'm following my father's footsteps and something, so I wondered. As a father figure, could I have a hug? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you don't have one, I'll give you a hug. The chief will give you much more. Yes, all the way in the back. Go for it. Uh, I've just been there and stare now. So just give you the title of the moment you're boxing and you're going back. So you can talk to me about that. You take Warren Green's Obama, give him some tough love, and that's you on the show. So I'd like that with you and uh, Aaron and the rest of the cast. Also wanted to bring up a huge Playwriter fan, love the origami. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> no, with everyone. Uh, this became something else, okay? I, I mean, uh, you know, Aaron, Trish, Katie, Jamie, you know, Callis, they're a part of a family now. And uh, as years go on, we'll, you know, we'll end up at everybody's funeral. Aww. So as we go, what? we'll all end up. <laughs> we'll come to your funeral. I'll say some kind things. I can hardly wait for mine. Can you imagine that one? <laughs> Here's Dan! Yeah! He wanted us to party! Yeah. He's not gonna die, he's just gonna download. <laughs> he doesn't have to worry, man. He's a Cylon. <laughs> No, but, you know, basically, it, it, yeah, Michael Hogan and myself are very, very, very uh, good friends now. And uh, he's, by far, has the most magnificent arc of the show, bar none. I mean, nobody expected this one to turn around like this. And I think his character just went, goes right through the roof. The last season, all these guys, just all the silence go right through the roof. And uh, they should, rightfully they should. That's where I think Ron was the most effective in really making us see first the differences and the incredible hatred and then the trying to understand it and most importantly what happens at the end, which you guys will see. It's breathtaking to be honest with you. Yes, right there in the back. Oh, right there. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, Mr. Thanks for coming by. Do you find with directing Oh yeah, Blade Runner was probably the single most effective piece of work I had done up to that point. Um, it was 1980 shooting that, and working with Ridley was a true blessing, especially the relationship to him and Decker. You know, Harrison Ford and him, it was monumental. You know, the relationship they had it was a real hate fest. <laughs> they really went at each other, big time. And uh, at the same time, they were just very professional and they did what they had to do. What I learned in that, in that uh, time period was uh, 
really the, the strength of story. Ridley and Scott is truly a great storyteller and one of the giants and a great production designer. That's really what his class is. So I learned a lot about that, a lot about style and production and all of that. And it was great. It helped me out immensely. I'm very grateful. And of course, he was very strong. He was very confident because he allowed me to bring in my own sense of what realities I was bringing into play. I brought in city speak, I brought in the languages, I brought in the origami, I brought in the Asian culture, which dominated the, by the show, the time the show started, it was dominated. And which it is going to. I mean, one out of every five people on the planet is Asian, so they definitely carry the strongest culture gene. So basically, he was very, very strong with that. I mean, when he got the origami, when we got to the end and he put the, the little piece in there, I said, right on, Ridley. <laughs> you know, he did it, man. Because, I mean, basically, Harrison, like Michael Hogan, like, you know, Aaron and a lot of the people, basically those two, he thought, I am not a replicant. <laughs> and he never played it. You know, he says, I never played it. He says, that's why you are one. <laughs> but, uh, it's exactly, and most of us didn't really catch it at the very beginning. It was just so masked, you know, that he was a replicant. And I was the only Blade Runner in the movie. <coughs> so it was really hard for a lot of people to take. You know, their hero was not real. He was part of the, the people he was chasing, so. It became something else. And I think now that it's gotten to 25 years and the final cut and everything else, I think people have finally said, wow, I get it. I get it, what he was trying to say and where he was going. Yes, go ahead. Um, probably your mouth's getting a little dry. Give uh, Mr. Douglas go a chance ahead. to speak. <laughs> I love your work on iRobot, by the way. Fantastic performance there. The guy behind the guy behind the guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really strong too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know I don't know how you did it but you stole the scene. I know. I, yeah. but, I really um, believed I was standing there quietly. <laughs> um look I mean obviously yeah you're a Cylon. Well the character is a Cylon now. No no I am I'm Cylon. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, but uh, just looking back, I mean obviously hindsight's twenty twenty. Do you feel looking back at any of the stuff you did in the series leading up to that moment, sort of like, wow, looking back at that, that really is sort of, I'm surprised they didn't catch it or anything like that, that pointed, that might have been pointing you in the, that direction that they were going? They had no idea that this was happening. They had not. <laughs> well, they then. didn't have a clue. So, uh, yeah, for anybody to say that the journey was pointed in one direction and then suddenly changed uh, is right. For people who say we had a plan all along, they're liars. <laughs> um, yeah, but it definitely informs season one, two, three, uh, everything leading up to it. What the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong show. <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I, I immediately looked back and thought, well, what the hell does this mean for everything that we've done? And then about the baby. I mean, I immediately thought of Nikki. Like, what does this mean for Nikki? So, um, yeah. So no clue. Who, I had no clue? Well, yeah. about all of the other stuff. Is this complete left field? It was complete left field. They were, I mean, they literally stuck up pictures on a wall and went, how about these five? Uh, how about these five? How about these? Well, this one's interesting. Ooh, the fans will hate this. Let's do that. <laughs> and that's how they came up with the, the final five. They literally sort of just went through a checklist and, and um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting. Wait till you see the fifth one is. Can't wait. <laughs> Right there, right back there. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, I was wondering what kind of personal liberties you take with your character. Like, aside from what the writers and the directors give you, like, I heard that early on the season there was that episode where you're just eating out of a massive bowl of pasta, and you were like, your answer to that was, Adama eats pasta. <laughs> Eddie does whatever the frack Eddie wants to do. And there's your answer. And that's it. I will say this, I've had creative control of my character since 1984 when I started Miami Vice. It's the only way I could take that show, per se. <laughs> since, since that moment in time, I have literally had total creative control of my characters every single time you've ever seen me perform. So what's you and what's the character? 
Well, basically, that's all. It's all me, and it's all the character. <laughs> and it's basically they, they. Let me tell you, they're brilliant. The writers, being being they, are brilliant because they put forth. I've never once contacted them and say he wouldn't do this. Never once. And when they put the forth stuff forward, and they take, I know what they do in their meetings. They must have just a hell. We'll have to do this. <laughs> oh, can you imagine what he's going to do with this? Can you imagine what he's going to do with this? Is the way that they talk, because basically the directors come in and they really try to keep us somewhat in story to sit, tell the story. And there's a lot of them that come in and they really have great understanding. But most of them come in and they could be behind the monitor and they go, "Okay, action." <laughs> and they're watching the show. <laughs> Do it again! <laughs> it's great, you know. Once in a while you get somebody that really knows the show. And they come in and then they go, well, I just say, you yeah, know, I understand it perfectly. Watch. And then you do what you need to do. But most of the time people have been very, very understanding of the real human drama that is going on. So they add to that. They don't try to develop character. They try to make sure that the truth is being hit. And, that, and that's all we can ask of anybody. Just make sure that my realities are strong, that you believe them. If you find something that isn't, is fluctuating, tell me about it. Let me know. And I'll try it again. And that's the best you can do. And so basically, that's what we've been able to understand. I think um, the only time that you ever got shut down is that scene where you were supposed to take a phone call in your quarters and you wanted to take it on the John. <laughs> There's a phone right inside the toilet we never use. Why don't we use this one? <laughs> hey, Donna. I'll be right there. Would that not have been plastic? I thought it would have been Tell to Hogan, Hogan, I'm gonna come out of the bathroom when the scene starts and just really nonchalantly close the door. <laughs> just come out here, just like, <laughs> you know, as a moment of reality that we don't replace. <laughs> the smell, the sweet success. And you're on a ship and you can't get away from it. That's it. Throw him down to the hangar deck sometimes. <laughs> damn noodles. <laughs> All the way in the back of the door. Go ahead. During your legendary career, what would you like to accomplish between now and your funeral? <laughs> now and the next time I see you. Gosh, and Evan, you know. The only thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be the longest living Olmos in, you know, captivity. So what I'm trying to do is live a life that will kind of like, I'm in, I'm 61 years old. I know I look good. Hey. I'm in midlife. Okay. So I'm trying to get to 120. And to get there, you have to really plan to get there. And you have to prepare. For that, so you have to really think about it. You can't just say, well, whatever destiny has in store for me, it doesn't work. <coughs> so basically, I am trying to make it to 120. That's my goal. And uh, my partner, Robert Young, who uh, has been directing us, he's 83. And uh, he's a classic, classic uh, documentarist. Uh, and he's the one that gave us a lot of our aesthetic that we use on the show. And uh, Bob did the boxing. Yeah. episode and it was so complex and and if you see the, the actually the uh, the DVD <laughs> the DVD sale uh, the one you have in your packets you know the DVDs they, they, that's a different version than the one that we showed in the air and that one's much stronger mm -hmm. it's much better matter of fact they're gonna start doing that I'm sure and start putting the longer versions because like 
this last show, I had to take out 27 minutes of the assemblage, and it was a brilliant story, and it really worked well. And to take out 27 minutes of them, you know, in a, I had to cut it down to 43 minutes, as much time we have to show on the air. So uh, hopefully they'll put, I think they, they called me yesterday and they want to put it all back for the, for the new TV. <laughs> Yes, sir. Go. two or three more, you know, seasons and kind of waffling as to, you know, because he was, you know, you could, he, the story's got to end someday. So why not end it really with the energy level of a real story being told and not being fabricated and, you know, like, oh, let's see where we're going to take him now. That he didn't want. So he had this charted out. <laughs> Believe me, when you see the final episode, you're going to realize this kid really knew what he was doing. He wrote the last four hours that have been cut down to three, and it's. I, I say the same thing. They should just, every ounce of footage they've ever gotten on this thing should be placed somewhere, and people should be able to see it because everything had something to say. The writers were fantastic. <laughs> I agree with you. And I agree with you, and I agree with many people that uh, this is the finest dramatic show <laughs> in television history so far. And I take that not because West Wing isn't great and Sopranos aren't great and all of these Deadwood. Deadwood. <laughs> and, and there's many lost, you know. All of these Oh come on! <laughs> it's one of his favorites. <laughs> and this is <laughs> all these shows don't really have uh, an understanding of itself, especially things like West Wing that were so poignant. But this took this genre allows you to take into understanding things that you can't touch in those kind of shows. And therefore, it got to a level that was much more intense and much higher. Rod Serling understood it. And, and that's why I think that he really took it. Twilight Zone went to a poof. Used to send people spinning. You know, in the 50s, it was fantastic. So this show, per se, has elevated, for me, dramatic structure as well as the science fiction genre to the highest level. And you all deserve it because you guys have all been part of this for your entire lives and you love this genre. And you deserve to know that dramatically you have pushed it to another level. And the next people that come across, whether it be in, you know, in, the, in the police station or in a courtroom or in a hospital or you know, in the White House, are going to have to deal with what the caliber of what we did humanistically that rang around the world. I'm not kidding you, you think it's hot right now. Like Blade Runner, 25 years from today, the show will be better understood than it is today and what it meant. And that's just what Blade Runner did. Blade Runner's like, you see it today and you go, wow, people who had never seen that program see it right now, they thought it was made last week. You know, they think they're watching it. You know, wow, this really happened. It's like great literature. When you see great literature, it could be written back in the 17th century, you know, so you say, wow. You really wrote this back then? Unbelievable. Don Quixote. Whoa. <laughs> Big time. The original, right? Yes, right here. Um, I know you can't talk a lot about like what's gonna happen, but I can't tell you anything else. What's wrong with you? They kill me. Right. Kill me. Right. Kill me. Right. People yeah. in here would really, I mean, get, uh, look, get angry. Right. Yeah. Well, you said you did a, you're doing a movie and you're you're filming mm -hmm. that, which means that there's some kind of continuation from no. the series. No, yeah. series cool. over. So series, series is done. The last thing you see at the end of season four is the last thing of the show. So we don't have to die waiting for another <clears throat> No, the movie kind of the movie is like season one, two, three. It's like Razor. It looks back and tells the story of people that you never got to see very much in season one. And uh, <laughs> so it's gonna be better than season one. You will be so 
happy that they made this movie, I can't even tell you. Because it really puts, pulls the whole thing together. And boy, it's, and it's going to be released after the show's over. So when you come back in on it and you start to read this and you start to see this and you, and you get these two hours, you're going to, and it might be longer, but it will be on the DVD, it won't be longer. But, uh, you know, the two hours that you'll see will be fantastic. And, and yes, he is the star of the show. So you will learn an awful lot about a lot of things, which is going to really, it's great for him. As an artist, I can't tell you what it does for him. So, yes, right there with the hat. I love the boat. <laughs> she gave me the boat. So I got, I got two questions. Are you Go planning ahead. on smashing the boat? <laughs> no. I wasn't planning on smashing the other one either. <laughs> it wasn't on the game plan. I'm going to smash this boat. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't have told me that, you know, Starbuck was dead. <laughs> and I want to smash the boat. <laughs> Especially since they just set me down and goes, you're working on this boat. Oh. <laughs> While this, oh yeah, okay, great. Here we go. Eddie, don't touch those cookies. Second <laughs> <laughs> question. Involved in all like the spin-off series, Caprica. Hmm. No, that's that's fifty years before us. Oh, okay. Fifty-five years before us, and I am approximately seven years old. So I come out at Willie, Willie Adams. That's who. That's what they call me, Willie. Willie. And my our family name was Adams. So, you know, it wasn't a Dama, it was Adam. So, and then my father finally turns around, realizes what he's doing to That guy. That guy. That guy. Go. I never thought it was possible for an actor to intimidate me through the screen. <laughs> I know Mary's terrifying, isn't she? She's <laughs> just here in life. She's horrifying. He's talking about me, okay? <laughs> I said Mary. Uh, <laughs> but some of, some of your scenes when you are uh, restrained in anger, um, it scared the hell out of me. So I, I literally thought you were going to reach the screen. <laughs> Imagine being this close to him. <laughs> How have you prepped yourself for that? What do you think about some of your captors? <laughs> it's not about... It's about hitting. The, it's about hitting the, the truth at the moment, and it's being there. It's really being in the moment, and your moment to moment has to connect. And that's really the basics of, of understanding what this craft is. And it's nothing more than being there. It's anyone can do this. You've all had the ability to practice being honest, being real, touching your emotions, feeling those emotions. And you've all expressed them somewhere. Now, try doing it with everybody in the room. Try doing it with everybody in the room and everybody's standing there and they're all waiting in there until like 55 people back there going like this, like this. And they're like, okay, ready? And quiet! Quiet! Shut up, everybody! And show me your emotions. Action! And it's true, man. It's like the most uncomfortable, ridiculous place to try to be real. That's the problem. There's no reality in what you're faced with at that exact moment, so you have to create it instantaneously. So, I mean, pre basically I've been doing this for so long now that my preparation is making sure that I understand the words, because basically I'm not like him. He never, ever, ever he prepares his lines. <laughs> he comes and learns them on the set. And, and and Susan Sarandon and a lot of artists do that. They want to keep it as fresh as possible so that they're really finding what it is that people are saying. I in turn work I thought I was just lazy. <laughs> That's good though. I was being kind. That's better. I like that better. <laughs> <laughs> Me personally, <clears throat> I work uh, I'm dyslexic, so I work on a very different level of understanding, so I don't, I don't know anything of what the other actors are going to say. I get all my script and I narrow it down to one paragraph, and then I marry that paragraph, and I have no uh, breaks in it. There's no, you know, 
commas or anything, periods, anything. It's just one solid understanding of everything. And then I have to listen to the other person I'm working with to see how in the world does this fit? Where do I talk? I mean, when do I have to say it, you know? Oh, it goes right here, I can tell. And then you say it. And then you're listening. Because the art of listening is really what that's all about. People have said to me, you don't say very much, but yet, even when they cut to you, you're really, like in Miami Vice, ridiculous. I mean, that was the one place where I'd never said, I took words, entire scenes I would take out. And I'd just say, just shoot me standing there listening. But aren't you gonna say, no, I'm not gonna say any of this. You know, just let me listen, and then I'll just look at the guy and say, book him. <laughs> let the audience put, the feeling and the words into what is happening. And the same thing with this character. This character listens really intensely, as did Jaime Escalante, as did all my other characters. So they listen, and that's one of the ways that I've done it. And so it, it's not that you like go off and... I remember James Dean when I was studying, and they would tell me that James would like rip. If he had like the scene where he, <clears throat> his father and him are having the big thing and from here to eternity, and he's coming down the stairs, and his father looks at me and he grabs his father, you don't love me, you don't love me. Well, he was like in his trailer before the scene started, completely annihilating it, and just people heard screaming, and wailing, and everything. It was a different method, you know. <clears throat> Martin Sheen for Apocalypse Now whacked out of his mind when he did uh, the drunk scene. He was just bombarded, man, and, 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 you know. I went to work, remember when I went to work? Oh, you went, yeah, you, no, I don't think you were there. I, I, went to, I do a scene where I'm completely wasted, completely whacked out of my mind as, as a dama, and I went to the set, whacked out of my mind, but, you know, acting, I was whacked out of my mind. So, in the end, pretty soon everybody's going, oh, shit, he's really fucked up. <laughs> Uh, Ed, why don't you sit down? I go, hey, sit where? <laughs> and, and, they, wow. and so I did the scene, and of course, you know, it, it's crazy, it's ugly, and, and I do it. And then when it was over, I just, whew, thanks a lot, guys, it was great. <laughs> but to do the same thing, you know, method, it's the, math, the madness of that method which makes you who you are. So basically, everybody has their own style. And everybody does it Callus stayed up for three days Oof. before 33, when we were all supposed to be really tired at the beginning. Oh. Yeah, and he couldn't work. He stayed up like in a trunk, like three nights in a row, and just kept staying up, stayed up. When he came to work, he was like so sallow and sunken, and I mean, even pastier white than his British pasty whiteness. And, uh, oh, I thought he looked like death warmed over. It was unbelievable. I went to makeup and got the same effect. <laughs> I slept for 11 hours. I think I played hockey the night before. You know, I just did. Had a beer. Classic. Yes, all the way in the back. Go ahead. I do that to all my wives. They don't tell us anything. Um, and she smelled like cabbage the entire time. Uh, I just thought it was something in our room, but uh, apparently it was her. Uh, no, they don't tell us a lot. I didn't see that one coming, because I really thought, like, in life, Nikki and I are uh, big brother, little sister, and I sort of look out for her and take care of her. And then on the show, Tyrell and Callie was very much the same way. So for them to suddenly be in a relationship, it was like kissing my mom, you know? It was just like peck on the cheek is fine at Christmas, but other than that, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, it was weird. I think um, uh, Tyrrell was trying to find a sense of normalcy, and uh, part of that is settling down and, and getting married, just trying to bring some kind of normal life to uh, the chaos that is the fleet. And that's what people were looking for all the time, they just went. And there's a lot of scenes about that throughout the show. 
where people are just talking, when can we just get back to normal? And then, you know, this is normal. But uh, just a piece of, of what used to be. So that, she got pregnant, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Although we never had sex, so I don't <laughs> know about that. I must say that uh, the scene where he, he exposes the cabbage, you know, to the audience and he says this is what he really felt and it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful performance that Aaron gave and uh, both of us together, I was listening, he was doing the whole scene and we lost it. The cameras didn't roll. Oh. Do you remember that? I said, oh, man, I the first so I, take, they decided take. it didn't roll. Yeah. They didn't turn them on and it was my best take. Oh. It was oh. I mean, I was like, so I was crying, it was just incredible, it was just emotionally just tense. I get to the end, I walk out, and, and then he's sitting there, and I go, because I'm directing it, and I go, cut! I said, man, and the first AD comes in and he goes, um, should we start rolling? <laughs> Six people lost their life that night. <laughs> Aaron was pissed. <laughs> Really pissed, and I was worse off than he was, man. I was ready. I said, oh. don't ever, under any circumstance, ever, from the moment I start to work, not shoot. You shoot every rehearsal. You shoot every single second of anybody saying anything that's in front of camera. Don't ever lose a second, because you never know what you're going to do and what's going to happen. So from that moment on, I mean, people were just walking on eggshells. Poor Shanley goes, oh. <laughs> Douglas, I'm so sorry, Douglas. Oh my God, I just had... Walk away from me right now, Shanley. <laughs> <laughs> it was really my boy. Alex, go ahead. So um, first, uh, you could get it back on him for London by telling the story for the first scene you had together. I will. But um, I was actually, I had two questions for you. The first one is in uh, Sine Qua Non, and the scene that you have with Apollo where you're talking and um, you're telling him that you're going after Rosalind, or Adama is telling him he's going after Rosalind. He's holding a frame in his hand in one shot. What's the scene longer, and what's the frame he's holding? The There's a frame. photograph of him and his brother. Okay. And that's who the, he was. That frame was being held. Was it was just for him. No. Well, yeah, probably. You don't see him move. So when did he pick it up? Yeah. No. Basically, when the scene starts, <laughs> he has it in yeah, his hand. Yeah. But and, and the scene did start with him looking at it and then turning and then I come into the room. But that's man. Would you like to see that or would you like to continue to get some of the story, yeah. you know, in there? Yeah, because we we have to cut out a lot of stuff. So. Many times you don't ever see people exiting or coming in, or you know you don't even see a wide shot of the scene, you know, and that's really made our style. So because of the, you only have 43 minutes, and everything is just as tight as it can be. So yeah, he he did a whole thing with it. He starts the scene off by himself in the room, and then I come into the room, okay. and so that's why you saw him holding something. Most people didn't even catch it. <laughs> you, you guys are, you guys are tough. Alex has watched it 87 times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I saw it the first time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, I, what I was wanted to ask you in, in London already was, um, you did suits with it as a play, and then you did it uh, as a movie. Was it difficult to, you know, like change gears with, you know, different takes or? <clears throat> I did a, a play called Zutsu, which was done in 1978, then went on to be done as a major motion picture. And uh, the performance that I gave on that was after four years of doing it on stage. Yeah. And so it was really, and so I, I did, we did very few takes, it was a two and a half million dollar production. I got $5,000 for putting that role on, on film from Universal, they made a fortune off of it. And uh, that's really the price you pay. And uh, basically, that performance, per se, was pretty much uh, the realities of what I was hitting on, on the stage. So it was a lot of fun. It was really easy, and I ended up having a great time doing it. I'm glad they documented it, you know, even though they got it for nothing. Yes, sir, Andres. Uh, any comments about working with Don Johnson? Comments? <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. Next question. <laughs> great guy. Go ahead. Question, uh, uh, what would you describe your uh, professional relationship with Ronald D. Moore 
And a second question is, you guys, now that the show's over, you guys probably had a big staff party. And how much scotch did we actually bring to the party? <laughs> he would know that. <laughs> How much scotch did Ron? Well, they threw a big giant party and there was lots of vodka, I remember that. Uh, the very last read through, I brought a bottle of. What did I bring? Was, did I bring a bottle? Of, I think I brought a bottle of Dalwini. <clears throat> and I had. Uh, yeah, because it was in the box. It was either Dalwini or Oban. I think it was Dalwini.